questions. And we're going to start um, with Dr. Holly Henson from OHSU. Um, hi everyone, I'm Holly Henson. I'm a physician, I'm a neurologist by training and a neurointensivist in practice. And I research traumatic brain injury, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about that. So I work uh, up at OHSU and have been there for seven years now. So uh, I'm a neurointensivist, and every time I say that, the person I'm speaking to two seconds ago is like, no, no, what, 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 what is that? So what that means is that I, uh, I, I so I'm a, an MD, I went to medical school, after that I did a residency in neurology, so I studied the brain and the neurospinal cord. And then did a two-year critical care fellowship, and so I work exclusively in ICU. So I don't see patients in the outpatient world; I just work in the hospital um, shifts in the intensive care unit. And I take care of patients that have uh, basically really bad things that have happened to their brain. They have bleeding in their brain. They've had strokes. They have seizures that won't stop. They have brain tumors. Uh, they need neurosurgery. Um, I don't actually do the surgery myself. I take care of the patients before and after the neurosurgery. But patients that are super sick and really need a lot of uh, a lot of critical care. I take care of patients in the ICU. The remaining 60% of the time, I do clinical research, and that clinical research is in traumatic brain injury. And so what's TBI? It's the severe end, or at least what I work on is the severe end of what you have probably heard of, concussion. So people get injured, hit their head, maybe it's in a high-speed motor vehicle collision, maybe it's something else, but um, patients that not just bump their head or kind of a little dazed, people that are lose consciousness and have some severe injuries. And so what we're working to understand in, uh, in our work is to how to figure out how not only the severity of the, the brain injury itself, but how that person's gonna do in the intensive care unit in the first 24 to 48 hours after they're injured. Sometimes CAT scans can give us some information about how bad the injury is, but a CAT scan can look terrible and the person can actually be doing okay and, and get better. And other times the CAT scan can look relatively normal and the patient doesn't wake up, they're in a coma. And it can be really hard to understand which direction a patient's gonna go based on just the CAT scan or even the clinical exam. And so we're using um, uh, some advanced techniques looking at not only the clinical characteristics of the patient, so how old they are, what kind of trauma they went through, other types of uh, medical problems they might have. We're combining that information with um, with what, what's called proteomics, or the study of protein in the in in our instance, it's in the blood, and looking at different proteins made by the immune system to give us clues of how that person is going to do in their acute clinical trajectory. So this is several CAT scans of patients that have had traumatic brain injuries, and so this is um so the person's like lying down with their back towards the ground and they're facing up towards the roof, right? And their head is being sort of cut like this. We would turn that axial. And so these are the eyeballs. This is the back of the head. And so this is uh, this is the brain tissue. This is this white thing is the skull around it. So this is some blood in the front part of the brain. And then, uh, so this is a, what's called a contusion or a bruise inside the brain. This is a patient with what's called a subdural hematoma. And then this is a person uh, that you can't, it's really hard to tell that anything's wrong actually, but there are these teeny tiny bright white things that are blood that represent something called diffuse axonal injury. And all these patients clinically can look identical, but their injuries are really different, and how they do after their injury can be really different. So we're looking at ways in which to predict that. And so these are some graphs of uh, some of these immune proteins, very specifically in this instance, um, IL-17, which is a T-cell signaler, and then um, IFN uh, beta, uh, which is a uh, a long story, <laughs> let's just put it that way. <laughs> but essentially, you know, something called cytokines, and we use those to help us with uh, some uh, predictive models. And um, so I was asked to, to tell you a little bit about if, uh, you know, students that work with us in clinical research uh, in our air quotes lab. So we don't have a traditional lab space with like a microscope and animals. I do clinical research, so it's all human subjects stuff. So there's not sort of like that traditional wet lab space. What we do instead is a little bit different. We're collecting data from patients from the electronic medical record. And so my students will be doing that, looking at uh, charts a whole lot transcribing some of that clinical data into clinical research databases like REDCap, for example, is one of them. 
be transporting biospecimens, shipping things, moving them around, finding the freezers that I don't even know where are that have all of my uh, biospecimens in, doing some literature searches, some manuscript uh, prep preparation. And I can't speak for all of the clinical research RLCs, but at least for mine, I really try to have my students come in and shadow me in the intensive care unit and see what it is that we do when we take care of patients that are critically ill. So that's a part, at least um, me specifically. And then I just wanted to say a couple of things about uh, some tips, some pro tips, if you will, for being successful this summer and then beyond when you're working with your mentors. And these tips are not just for now, it's really for your whole career. Like I still have mentors that I work with extensively have helped me so much throughout my career and I, I try to do these things too like this is this is advice for not just now but but really the for, forever so attitude is kind of everything I mean it's not a hundred percent everything but it's a lot right so if you show up and you're engaged you're enthusiastic you're excited about it that's gonna be fantastic you're not gonna do everything right and you're not gonna know everything. Like obviously, you're not supposed to at this stage or really at any stage. So taking feedback really gracefully, trying not to be defensive and being like, well, uh, you know, and giving 40 excuses why you didn't know that, just be cool. Like take the feedback, be like, okay, do better next time, incorporate it. And that's gonna give your mentor uh, encouragement to actually help you more if you're graceful when you take that. Um, be clear on what you need. There are certain things that you probably want to learn, certain interests you have that you really want to get out of this summer. And so show up when you're talking with your uh, PIs and with your, uh, with your mentors. Be very clear about what you need, what you want to learn, um, and be very specific. And showing up to meetings with very specific questions or things you want to cover in the meeting as opposed to just being totally scattered and be like, oh, like, I don't know. What are we doing today? You know, that's you're going to get more out of it, basically, being prepared. And then finally, uh, your mentors are super. Everybody's super busy, right? You guys are super busy. We're super busy. So being really mindful of your mentor's time, and if you need them to sign something for you, or fill it out out an evaluation, or review something you've written, yeah, sending them to sending that document the night before uh, is probably gonna make them mad you know give them a little lead time and the more complex it is the more um, steps that that person needs to do uh, to help you give them more lead time so if they have to review a whole paper or a couple of weeks is helpful if they just need to quickly sign something or just say yes or no then maybe an email the day before is appropriate just gauge but definitely remember these folks are super busy and um, you can get what you need if you give them lead time super helpful okay maybe this is all really obvious you all know this already okay very cool I think that's all I have I only have five minutes so I'll be happy to take your questions after thanks so I'm Marilyn Macris in the chemistry department and I do a number of different things other than work on nanostructured materials for medicinal applications. So I'm also a career mentor for the Lexido. I'm a research mentor. Uh, my entire lab is all undergraduate students in the chemistry department, which is really unique. Uh, it doesn't exist, um, well, except for my lab. Uh, I'm also one of the enrichment leads uh, with Lisa. And this fall, you get to see my face first, and then Lisa, you get to see Lisa's face for a whole year. So if you're um, here on campus this fall for Build Exito, uh, you will be seeing me, and we're going to talk about professional development throughout the entire year. So as she mentioned, being able to ask for things that you want, if there's a specific technique you want to learn, I'm going to teach you how to go about asking for those things and negotiating for things for yourself, how to find the right career mentors, how to build relationships with career mentors. All right. So uh, in my lab, uh, we work on a number of different projects. Um, I am doing all of this because I have really wonderful students. Uh, we work on different types of materials for drug delivery. So one of our applications is to enhance uh, cancer therapeutics to cancer cells, a uh, number of different cancer cell lines. So we work on building nanomaterials that would allow us to image tumors, but also deliver drugs uh, to those specific tumors. We also work on nanostructured materials that can be optical agents that we can use to visualize things inside of the eye. So for example, I work with um, a partner at the KCI Institute and the Oregon Primate Center. And what we do is we label stem cells that repair blindness and we want to track where these stem cells go inside of the eye um, to see how long they survive and where they migrate once they get inside of the eye. So I work on the optical imaging agent that allows us to track these stem cells once we inject them into the eye using optical coherence tomography 
as a visualization tool. Um, we also work in Alzheimer's disease uh, area. So one of my students is building a high throughput screening assay that allows us to screen drugs for specific targets that play a role in Alzheimer's disease progression. Um, and she looks at also characterizing um, this particular target so that we can identify which is the most toxic species that may play um, a role in neurodegeneration. Um, the other thing to do is every time we make a na new nanomaterials, we want to make sure that they're biocompatible and they're not going to have any type of human health impact or environmental impact. So we look at the biocompatibility of our nanomaterials with someone at Oregon State University that does all of our nanomaterial testing because we want to make green, sustainable materials that are not going to have um, human health impact. And so I didn't include uh, some other things that we're doing now. Uh, we also work in yeah, the area of glaucoma um, as well, so I would say just in the eye world. And we look at, for all of our applications, we want to know how nanoparticles get into cells that we're designing them for. So we look at nanoparticle biological interactions as well. Um, and I think that's about it. Uh, so we have a lot of different collaborations. We're a basic chemistry lab. Uh, we have a cell culture lab for us to be able to do those types of studies. And then we partner with OHSU because we want to build things, but we want to build things that do something, not just pretty things. Okay, um, so mentorship and sponsorship, I'm really big on this. So there's a lot of stuff on here. She's covered a lot of it um, already. But um, in terms of men mentorship, you know, be open-minded, be, uh, try to come knowledgeable, be patient, um, be honest about what you want and what you want to get out of the research experience. Um, develop a, you know, we, we help you develop a focused path in life. So being able to communicate with us about what you want to get and what you want to do helps us help you achieve those goals. Um, in my lab and also through the enrichment, you're going to learn how to develop leadership and networking skills. Networking skills are really going to help you propel your career forward. So that's something I work on with my students, but also you're going to get a lot of that um, this coming year um, in, uh, in the enrichment session. So it's something you don't want to miss for sure. Um, I think she, she did a really good job here. So lab expectations. Uh, in my lab, because we're with chemistry lab, safety is priority for me. So follow all of our safety rules. We work with um, cyanide and things like that. So um, I don't want you to die from that. So you have to follow very uh, strict rules about uh, the protocols we have. Nobody's died so far, so they're doing a good job. Um, <laughs> you know, recognize that your, ment your, mentee your mentor's time is valuable. And she made a comment about being able to give your PI time to look at things. So last night, my students decided to send me their um, their uh, posters to review that's due for printing uh, on Saturday. And so I got up at 6.30 so I can look at that. Uh, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> uh, but giving them enough time to be able to, to help you and to put your best foot forward. Be really active listeners. Always have a notepad when you have a meeting with your PI so that you can take notes because we spit out a lot of things at you and we think you're going to memorize all of it. No. That's not feasible, so always have a notepad when you go into a meeting with your, your PI. If you go to seminars, bring a notepad with you. It's like the most important tool you can walk around with, I think. Um, have confidence in yourself and don't apologize too much. You make a mistake, fine, right? You move on from it. You don't have to apologize for it too much. We expect that you're going to make tons of mistakes. And so we're going to expect that you learn from those mistakes as well. And if you're not sure about anything, always ask questions. I don't care if you ask me 10 times the same question. We want to make sure you're comfortable and confident in yourself um, and that you don't make a mistake. Okay. So always ask questions. You know, enjoy the relationship with your team. So my team of students are all undergraduates. They're all taking chemistry or biology or physics. And so your team is your support group. And I love my team of students because they help each other and they don't always have to come to me to ask questions. At all. At all. So learn to build relationships with your team, be on time, and stick to a schedule. So if you're going to be there at 9 o'clock, be there at 9 o'clock. Give yourself time you know, to get there on, um, and don't be late to things. Uh, let's see. Keep a good notebook. That's so important. So in my lab, there are so many steps and things that we're building that you need to make really good detailed notes. If you think, I'm going to write it later. Later doesn't come, stuff happens. So as you're doing things in a lab, take really good notes. About, notes. Um, it doesn't matter if your lab notebook looks ugly, 
Nobody cares. As long as the stuff is in there, um, it doesn't have to be pretty and perfect. So I tell my students, always um, make sure your notebook's updated. Um, in my group, we work on research on literature presentations, and I teach you how to do that. So learning how to read the literature will be really critical for you. It's going to help you. So anytime I don't know something, I go to the literature because there's an answer there. And somebody's done something close. So I teach myself things I don't know that way. And clean up after yourself. Um, and take ownership of problems in the lab that arise. So don't wait for somebody to do something. Take ownership and do it. Because people will thank you for helping out. Uh, let's see. There's nobody with a little card saying, you're done. Um, I think that's it. Because she did a good job already telling you some of these things. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lisa Marriott. I grew up in Virginia. And when I was your age, I wanted to be a medical doctor. I loved science. And that is the path that I thought that you take if you love science. And when I was in my first year of college, my best friend in high school said, take this class, this neuroscience class, with my advisor. And I said, why would I take this class? I do not know anything about neuroscience. And it changed my life. So instead of going into medicine with many of the huge courses, I was taking very small classes in psychobiology, neuroscience. I ended up creating my own major in neuroscience between chemistry, psychology, and biology, and loved it. I was in the lab, I was doing brain surgery, I was studying learning memory, you were doing predictions of what an animal will do based on the brain chemistry at the time, in real time. It was awesome. I loved it. So after I graduated, I decided that instead, I wanted to study that more. And so I went into a neuroscience PhD program. I studied uh, inflammation in the brain, and I studied learning and memory in the context of that. After that, I wanted to know, I knew the systems, and I wanted to know more about the molecular biology of how those things were working. I took all of my samples with me that I collected, and I came to OHSU at the time. I did a postdoc in physiology and pharmacology up at the Hill. And I did the molecular biology, the westerns, and all of those pieces that are underneath of those system level samples, which was really cool. But then, as you're going in, again, I really love that systems perspective. I was realizing that I was going a little bit too deep into where I wanted to be in my happy place. And so what I ended up learning is that I really love learning a memory. I really love how that works. And I like seeing the overlay of how science and the, the development of science as a process overlaps with that. So for my next postdoc, I did I worked in teacher professional development and how do you talk about science and cutting edge aspects in biomedical research for the public. So I did that for many years and then uh, thinking that I would plan my life around um, my job around my pregnancy. I have a daughter, I have a, a family. I plan my pregnancy around my job and of course you switch jobs right as you're moving. And so what where I ended up moving is just next door because they needed someone to help translate biomedical science to the public as part of this large fair experience and what does that even mean? So essentially there is this one week thing at OMSI and you're like well why would a one little week thing make a difference in your career? And so keep an open mind for all of your perspectives. I think that's my uh, story that I'm going to tell you is that this one little week long thing ended up being, I've been with this program now s since 2009. And so essentially what this program does is it translates aspects of research for the public, it provides education, it collects research data, and it continues to move forward. So what does that actually mean? So the program is called Let's Get Healthy. It provides uh, assessments of sleep or diet or physical activity or stress or body composition or mental health. At the same time, you get immediate feedback on how you're doing, the data are collected, and going across the different levels. So if you want to study the relationship between how much someone is sleeping and their stress levels and how they're eating, you can do that. So I've, we've built the informatics that support that. We work with uh, OHSU's uh, Oregon, uh, Oregon Clinical and Translational Research Institute, Oak Tree, who you'll hear more about as you go through this process, but they, do it, they have a huge infrastructure. So we work with them to do the informatics. I also work with the OHSU Evaluation Corps and 
in that capacity, we do projects all around the state. So, for example, we just finished a project looking at opioids in Southwest Oregon. So I touch a lot of different areas. And what I'm realizing is that I don't go as deep as I used to, but I do go very, very broad. And I use a lot of different methods to do that. So, for example, in 2014, we got a grant to do epigenetics. So we're doing teacher professional development in epigenetics, teaching middle school students about epigenetics, which was so brand new at the time. You're like, how are you going to teach this if you don't even know what it is? And that's the part which still gets me chills today, is like, it doesn't matter. That's the part of learning that is so cool, is that you are going to go through, figure out what you don't know, what you do know, and the parts that need to be communicated. So uh, that ended up winning a, an award, which is awesome. We have a skin cancer game, which ended up winning an award as well. That was using a, a game-based approach. Uh, we've won technology awards for integrating games and data collection. And I still get nervous. Like, I've talked about this how many times, and I still get nervous about talking about these things. So those parts don't go away either. Uh, I have a couple students in my lab. So uh, Tila, I believe, talked with you, what was that? Yes, today is Friday, so that was Wednesday. So she's working on the uh, a skin cancer uh, algorithm scoring. So right now it's uh, underrepresenting. Uh, individuals of color of how sensitive they are to the sun so we're making sure that the scoring al algorithms that we're using are actually appropriately characterizing their skin response so that's one part that we're doing another part is that because we are so friendly if you will uh, you have a lot of characters so Ricardio the heart is one of our mascots and Stomley the stomach and Livia the liver like these are like little things that are just you know, they're just for fun but it turns out that people appreciate those materials, and the materials that we develop for the adults, people don't want that. They want the materials that we develop for kids. So we've done a lot of work with middle school. I spend a lot of time there. I spend a lot of time at community events, and now everything is now mobile, and it can all be done web-based, which is pretty cool. So there's less moving and like physically driving a box truck, which I really appreciate. And the other part is because it's so friendly, it allows us to be picked up by other groups. So. Right now, our program has been picked up by the Great Lakes Science Center in Ohio, so it's a permanent museum exhibit there. And it's also been picked up in Thailand. So right now, we're working with um, the largest hospital system there. They have 60 hospitals across Thailand and Southeast Asia. And they've integrated it with their electronic health records to then assess health. And then we're helping them build out, because we work with Oak Tree, helping them build out their information systems so they can then provide consent to their individuals and follow these people over time because they get annual health exams every year. So I spend a lot of my time translating various aspects of science back and forth. And it's really fun. And part of the days you're like, I can't believe this is my job. I really can't believe that it's my job. And other days you're like, how am I going to get everything done? But either way, it's, it's still really, really fun. So uh, I have, I'll have three Exodus students in my lab at the end of this summer. We have one more joining at the end for induction. And then one is Tila is in public health. And then Mark is in uh, math and statistics. So. Okay, so uh, I'm Suzanne Mitchell. Um, I'm a professor um, up at OHSU, and I have several departments that I affiliate with. So my primary affiliation is behavioral neuroscience, um, but I'm also affiliated with psychiatry and with the Oregon Institute of Occupational Health Science. Um, and as you can probably hear, I am not American. I'm one of those immigrants. <laughs> um, and, um, I, 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 and like Dr. Murray, I never thought that I would be here. Um, I'm a first generation college student. My father was so unhappy when I I sort of went to college. My best friend went to work in a bank as a bank teller from high school. And he was, he was like, why can't you do what Sarah is doing? She has a good job. And what do you want to do this for? And we had some emotional rocky times. Um, and, but he sort of came around, but I never thought that I was going to continue. But uh, like my colleagues here, we love what we do. 
And we're kind of curious, and we want to know how the world works. And we had good mentors who interacted with us. So, yeah, I never thought that I would stay in science. I thought maybe I'd be a bank manager by now. Um, my dad hoped I'd be a bank manager by now. But instead, I feel like my days are very fulfilling, trying to answer questions about why people do what they do. And the translational neuroeconomics, that deals with economics, how we weigh costs and benefits when we decide what to do. That's the economics bit. The neuro bit is because not only am I interested in the behavior, but I'm also interested in the neuroscience. What parts of the brain are involved when we make decisions about, oh, I really want that, but I don't want to pay for it. Um, or, I, I went to like a street fair a couple of years back, and they had some things, and I was like, even if you paid me, I don't want that. <laughs> and that's what economics is, and the neuro is what's going on in your brain when you're making those decisions. The translational bit in the lab is because we work with people, but we also do some things with animals. We use mice, and we use rats, and the reasons why we do that is that you have a little bit better control. So, when you're a person who takes a lot of drugs, like maybe you have a bit of a, a, a cocaine thing. <laughs> I bet it's not a surprise to you, even if that people who do that think a little bit differently about what's important and what things they want and what things they don't want and what will they pay for and what they won't. But people who have a bit of a cocaine thing have a whole sort of life that may contribute to that decision making. So if you look at animals and give them chance to take cocaine, which they will, <laughs> you can control a little bit about did they have an unpleasant family history? You can control that. And so that's one of the reasons we work with animal models. That and nobody's volunteering their little children to come and live in the lab for 10, 20, 15 years, and then have me give them cocaine. <laughs> so, one of the things that we, we study is we look at how choices are made. And here's a choice right up here. Would you rather have $10, and this is hypothetical, $10. Uh, would you have that in a week? Or, would you like me to give you another hypothetical $9 right now? I would rather have $9 right now than wait a week for an extra dollar. I bet some of you feel the same. Anybody feel the same way? Just nod? Yeah, yeah. Some of you might think, oh, $10, I'll, I'll wait a week for $10. You look like a reliable person who would actually give me money. We study those choices. We make choices like, would you wait for something that's a bit better all the time? We also look at costs like working hard. Would you work hard and get $10? Or would you take $9 and you only have to do a little bit of an iffy job? You know, just as get away with it. We study those questions um, in the lab. 
and these are just some current projects we have. We're trying to develop a measure of willingness to exert effort. Like, oh yeah, I'd, I'd be willing to work for this thing. I'd be willing to work for a degree from PSU. All of you should be answering yes to that. Um, because we think that if you're willing to work at something, have a lot of grit, maybe for those individuals who, who have a bit of a drug issue, maybe cessation and stopping using is easier for those people who have that sort of personality. So we're looking at that. We're also looking at genetics. So we have some genetically modified rats. We're not genetically modifying any people up there, in my lab at least. Um, and we want to know, are the particular genes that are involved in willingness to work or willingness to wait? Um, and those are the sorts of projects that we involve ex build Exito students in, and we have a lab with graduate students and undergraduates and high school students, so you get to mix with a lot of people. Okay, thank you. I think my time's up. Hello, uh, I'm Sam. Um, I'm a graduate student in Dr. Jun Zhao's lab, uh, and she's in the mechanical and materials engineering uh, department. Uh, regrettably, I didn't bring a PowerPoint, um, but we deal with nanoscale stuff, so you wouldn't be able to see it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, what our lab is sort of interested in is uh, development of nanomaterials, so stuff like graphene, which is a single atomic layer of carbon atoms, uh, and then carbon nanotubes as well, which is essentially rolled up graphene. Um, and so we, uh, we fabricate these materials through a variety of processes, uh, and then we um, characterize them using electron microscopes uh, and Raman spectroscopy and a litany of other uh, things. Um, and so I guess um, that's sort of a summary of what we do. Uh, as far as being a good student, uh, I would say uh, it's always good to be on time and to follow a good schedule uh, and to, to not be afraid to ask questions. So uh, our lab has a lot of sort of scary looking uh, equipment because it looks really complicated, but uh, in the end, it's just put, uh, pushing a bunch of buttons. Uh, it's not really that difficult. Um, you just have to have sort of the mindset and not, uh, you know, keep focused and not um, be distracted. Um, so yeah, uh, and then yeah, just don't be afraid to ask questions. <coughs> and if you have any questions, you can always talk to me about graduate school or basketball or whatever. Um, yeah, that's. <laughs> so, thank you, Drake, for thinking I'm a doctor. I'm not a doctor. Um, I actually am a senior research assistant at OHSU in the trauma research lab. Um, so, I actually wear a, a lot of hats. I'm the volunteer supervisor and I'm the coordinator supervisor, and you'll learn what that means in just a moment. So, we are a 24 7 clinical lab. Um, that means that someone is literally always on campus and what they're doing is they are going to the different traumas that come in through the emergency room and they in their head have an idea of all the different studies we have going on and I believe we have eight or nine active studies that we are screening for when patients come into the emergency room and our coordinators they go to the traumas and they, um, you know, take down some information, listen to the report from the EMT, and potentially later on go and approach those patients and tell them about the different studies, ask them if they'd like to participate. So they're talking to, um, they're talking to patients. They could be talking to family members if the patients are um, not consentable. So they, you know, maybe hit their head and are sort of concussed and can't actually formulate sentences and make educated decisions about research. So we would talk to family at that point. We do also have two active uh, model labs in which we use a swine model. So we use pigs. 
and then we also have a basic science side. So a lot of our studies um, have uh, like plasma samples or blood samples in which we look at different markers on the blood and cytokines and inflammation markers and things like that. And so our basic science person, uh, she'll run like the ELISA assays and the, the different assays that go with those studies. And we actually uh, collaborated on a TBI study with uh, Dr. Susan Rowell, who I believe was your mentor. And um, we, sorry? Yeah, so we've, we've collaborated with Holly because she's interested in traumatic brain injury and, well, brain injuries are traumas. And so we do collaborate with uh, brain, in, brain injury and TBI a lot. Um, so what we would do is, um, we've had Exodo students for the last couple of years. We've actually, three of the Exodo students we've had in the last couple of years, we've hired as study coordinators. So I don't know if you are familiar with uh, Keely McConnell, Sean Van Walkeren, and uh, Ariane Audette. We've actually hired all of them as study coordinators. So they finished their Exodo hours, and now they are employees of our lab. Um, and so we would obviously provide training. So we would teach you how to go and screen for these different studies. We would teach you how to talk to family and talk to patients. And um, you know, the other thing that we like people to do is to have that kind of clinical side, but also to have some sort of individual project in the lab, whether it be um, chart review studies, so looking through patients' charts and taking information from those charts, um, working with animals, if that's something that you're interested in, or you know, developing your basic science side, so working with assays too. So we'd like people to have you know, both, both sides get opportunities to work in both areas, clinical and then either animal or basic science. Um, we have monthly coordinator meetings that all of our coordinators try to come to. And we have weekly research meetings. So we sit around the table and we go through every study we have going on. You know, we could have 50 active studies um, and we just go through the status of all of them, where they are, what needs to be done, what has been done, things like that. Um, you would have a quarterly check-in with the coordinator supervisor, so that's me, um, just to make sure all of the you know, protocols that we're going through, you know how to go through all those protocols, you know how to talk to family, you know, you know how to do each study component for each individual study we have going on and any sort of additional training or questions, you know, I would be there to support you and answer your questions and if you felt like you needed more training on a subject, I would provide that as well. Um, and then the individual project, which I already talked about. So like I said, we like people to get experience on both sides. So in the hospital setting and then also in a lab setting. Um, you know, a lot of our studies, because we're working with people and patients, sometimes we're working with study drugs. There are institutional guidelines, there are FDA guidelines. We have to make sure we're following those because it could be harmful to the patients. Um, you know, we also have to keep in mind that we're talking to people these people or these family members have just gone through some sort of trauma, so we have to keep that in mind too. Um, and the other huge plus is the ability to multitask, especially in a hospital setting. You could be doing one thing and then the pager goes off and you have to run to the emergency room and you have to come back to what you're doing and just try and get as much done as you can. Um, and then individual products, which I went through, but there's, um, what, I, what I would advise is if you have an interest in anything that we do, um, you know, in trauma or emergency medicine, come to one of our weekly research meetings. We go through all of the studies. We can give a brief overview of the study. And then if, you know, this lab was something you felt like you wanted to get involved in, then you can contact the appropriate people. But we're always happy to have people sit in on our meetings and just hear about what we do. Um, so how you can be successful, um, you know, I'll just reiterate some things. Being organized, so having a schedule, knowing when you're going to come in. We love knowing when you're going to come in and being reliable and coming in when you say you're going to come in. Um, keep in mind that, you know, you guys, you guys are busy, so you might have sports and school and classes and 
this commitment and other clubs and things. Um, so I don't want to say to be overzealous, but keep in mind that you will have to find time to do all of those things. But just try and do something social too. You know, try and do something relaxing and that doesn't cause as much stress. Um, <coughs> ask questions. You know, ask questions about whatever it is you're interested in learning about, because that's the only way you're going to learn about it. Um, and then communication is a is big for us. You know, if you are sick or have a class or have a final, and you're like, I can't come in and do my hours this week. That's fine. Let's just talk about a makeup plan. But an open line of communication. Um, you know, we're we're pretty cool to work with. I'm sure Holly can. Um, <laughs> we're pretty cool to work with. You know, we're we're happy. We, we just want to make sure you get the knowledge and, you know, learn as much as you want to learn. Um, and the nice thing is you can also get the opportunity to network. You know, we have um, study coordinators that you'll be working with. We have the, the Division of Trauma has, I think, 10, um, you know, trauma surgeons. We have 10 trauma faculty that you can shadow. Um, we have other services that we work with, like neuro and cardio and you know other services. And so you, if you have interest in medicine, but maybe not necessarily trauma, we can probably work on getting you some shadowing time in a service that you're interested in. But that's all I have. I'm happy to take questions afterward. Um, I, my name is Melissa. I am a certified vet tech studying biomedical physics. Um, I'm curious for those of you who have um, who work with animal models, uh, what kind of um, tasks or responsibilities would an exito student or intern have with sort of dealing with animal models? Okay, so. Um, so in my lab, as I mentioned, we use mice and rats. Um, there's some husbandry that's involved. So we, uh, we use food restriction because we give them food. And if they're full, they're not interested. So husbandry, like making sure that their weights are OK, that we're not food restricting them too much, feeding them. Um, we also have behavioral procedures so they can choose what to eat and things. Um, we have other behavioral procedures so you'd be handling animals um, and also collecting data, perhaps collecting observational data and entering that and also uh, processing data that we collect using computer systems. So you'd be required to take the Animal Care and Use Committee um, handling class because we don't just let people go in and start picking up the mice and the rats. Like, you don't, we don't want you to traumatize them and them to traumatize you. So there's a whole sort of system and things. But yes, in my lab, there would, um, there would be learning about the ecology of the animal, handling the animals, and watching out if they're not feeling that great. Like, your responsibility would be to report to me, oh, yeah, you know, no, number four, 1472 looks a little bit iffy today. Come and have a look at him, Suzanne. So. Anyone? Well, I'm, I'm curious if like the, uh, the variation, uh, the variation between um, like hand holding and independence would that would be required for um, one of us. Yeah, I can start with that, and yeah, and it's gonna it's gonna vary, right? Depending on uh, the person, I, I think it, it just is gonna be individualized, right? And so, in terms of if it's something brand new, you have no exposure to whatsoever, then there's you know gonna be a period of a little bit more intense and close supervision that will 
grade, you know, as the person becomes more comfortable. So if you have like all this wonderful veterinary experience, you know, you're going to fly through the class and like be uh, out there on day one. If you've never been in a, a lab setting before, never handled animals, then clearly there's going to be a little bit more of a, uh, a sort of a run in period, if you will. But I think each of us is uh, experienced enough as, as mentors to have a good intuitive sense of where folks are and what they need to be uh, successful and each of us really want you to be in a in an incremental way more and more independent because that's the whole point right is to get you to a point where you're not a hundred percent independent but you certainly can do your tasks confidently and not need somebody you know breathing over you the entire time so that's definitely the goal for uh, for each of us but I think it's another one of those areas in which if you feel uncomfortable you don't have to be um, stoic about it right so you should say hey I realize I just went through that training I don't feel comfortable with this pipetting technique I don't feel comfortable uh, speaking to this family please you know come with me this is what I need so being vocal about your comfort level and articulating really clearly like I feel comfortable doing this by myself I don't feel comfortable in this area I think really helps us even though we are pretty good about being intuitive please go ahead and, uh, and speak up if you don't feel comfortable I have a sort of um, see one, teach one, do one kind of training. Um, so obviously, you know, teach you how to do something, and then I would have you do it while explaining to me what you were doing, so teaching me how to do it, and then have you do it on your own. Um, I think that when learning something new, the best way to master it is to then teach it to someone. So that's sort of how I go about when training new people. Hi, so if we're looking down the list of the RLCs and the ones that, that jump out at us and grab our attention are not necessarily the ones that are most in line with what we think we want to study, would you prefer we, I don't know, where along that spectrum is best, if that makes sense? Hi, this is Lisa. So don't worry if you don't find the lab that's not ideal for you. There are plenty of examples of people who have found I, who have found their labs that are not an RLC and they have recruited them to become an RLC. So you have an example right over here actually. So So I started in the lab before getting accepted into Build Exodo, and once I got accepted, I went to my PI and I was like, hey, would you like to become an RLC? And she's like, yeah, I'd love to, and it happened. <laughs> so. Networking. Uh, so I've been affiliated with Build Exito for quite some time and have had people in my RLC every year. Sometimes people have stayed for two years. Sometimes people have, have switched out. So right now, um, I'm just in the process of transitioning um, Maverick Gray, and they are moving to trauma. You are so fortunate. They are just awesome. And, but it fits with their interest so much better but I think that they learned something from me and I don't feel sad. I feel, I feel really happy that they're finding a better fit. And I think good RLCs are going to promote your growth so that if you explore something and go, ah, I thought that was for me, but maybe it wasn't, we're going to support your decision to move on. Apparently really like this microphone a lot. So I was just gonna say, <laughs> go for something that sounds cool and maybe it's something you have no exposure to because sometimes that serendipity really shapes someone's careers. There are things that you haven't been exposed to that you could potentially love and change your entire life. So you're a psychology major, but you're reading about this engineering thing that sounds awesome. Go do the engineering thing. Uh, so what's the biggest um, difference, or I guess, what does it look like working in a clinical lab versus a regular basic science lab? So our clinical lab is a little different, I think, um, just because we 
we do provide the you know unique opportunity to kind of get involved in consenting patients for research and you know we teach you how to do that and um, I, I don't so I started in a basic science lab um, and it was sort of very monotonous and it was you know the kind of the same things day after day this is just this is just me um, sort of the same things you know day after day and I realized that I really wanted to work with people and work with patients and you know felt like I was making a difference in their lives and that's why I moved into a clinical lab um, and so just getting to talk to people and maybe being that person that kind of grounds them in a very kind of hectic situation um, that that's kind of one of my rewards that I get out of research um, does anyone want to talk about these? <laughs> I think sometimes people think that in a basic lab it can't be monotonous. Um, there are things you have to do, so I always say do everything in triplicates of three, and if you get the same answer, you're good. We can move on. Um, I think people think that in a basic lab that all you do is sit in front of a little computer or you're doing the work in the lab and you're not going to talk to people and People think that scientists are not friendly. That's a total lie. Um, you get to engage. In my lab, my students are chatting all the time. Um, they're talking about their classes. They're talking about their research. They figure things out by talking to each other. Sometimes I go in there and I start talking to them about a problem that I'm having. And I really don't need them to solve the problem or tell me what to do. Because by talking to them, I figure it out. So do, they do the same type of thing. Um, in my lab, it's really different. There are no grad students. So the students in my lab are not, um, you know, making traditional buffer. I mean, they have to do all those things for themselves, but they're asking their own questions. And I want my students to go into the literature and ask new questions and come up with new experiments that I haven't thought about. I don't want robots. Um, I want people that are thinking and engaging and asking questions and going, what if? What if we did this? What if we did that? Have you thought about this? No. Maybe I want to do it. Maybe I think what you have is a good idea and we should try it, even though it's not something we traditionally do. Because those types of research shifts us into new directions. So I love it when students are asking a lot of questions. And I don't feel it is monotonous, although if you ask Eleanor, who sits in the basement and takes scans after scans, it could be boring. But you're, the instrument's running the scan, there's tons of other things you could be doing while the instrument's running a scan, so you're not bored. Okay, we have time for one more question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, I can. Uh, so I, for a period of time, wanted to be a doctor when I was in undergrad. Um, and so I did clinical research uh, with just you for a bit in the emergency room. Uh, and I can say that in just a basic science lab, there's a lot less red tape, uh, so you don't have to worry about stuff like IRB approval, that sort of thing. You can just sort of do whatever you want um, within limits. <laughs> yeah, and engineers. Um, so yeah, if you're really creative and into that sort of thing, then I think it's a, a good fit. Thank you. Um, has there ever been a situation where you've had, um, it's been really competitive to get into a specific RLC where you've had, you know, like one spot or two spots and you've had like five students wanting to get into your RLC? Anybody that? I can answer that because I'm part of the little group that ends up matching people and that's, uh, that, that turns out to be not uncommon. We, at the way students get into RLCs, established RLCs that are set up, is we do a nice thing called a matching fair, where we have a, an, most of an afternoon or a piece of an afternoon down in a building that we share, the PSU and OHU, OHSU share. Um, but at the end of that, everybody's got a list. Students have a list one through four of who they want. We've asked RLCs, people they've talked to, and they give us a list of the people that, you know, they're sort of their preference order. And we do the very best job we can. I think last year, every student got their first choice. Pretty sure that's true. We usually don't have to go too far down the list, but sometimes we do. 
And some of it comes back to occasionally we can go to an RLC and says, look, you really do have five people that went in. Can you do something extra? But you can see from what these people describe that different situations you know, limit their ability to take on people. If they've already got two and they've got room for one more, they have room for one more, not a bunch more. But it's a, it takes us, we give ourselves a month actually to make sure we've negotiated all that correctly. And even then we end up with some, you know, it's always a few that you're dealing with at the very end. Um, I think in the interest of what, I'm gonna let, Sometimes you think that there's only one lab, but at the RLC fair, you engage with so many different faculty. You think, oh, that person sounds cool. I might want to pick them, or that other person sounds cool. And then you have to decide, okay, there's five people I want to work for. How am I going to decide? That's the problem you're going to face. Um, so we are at our time, and I got the thumbs up from the the big director, so I think he wants us to stay on time. Thank, thank you. you very much. Let's thank our panelists.